He helped to co-found the and create the iPod, uh, and then something else called the Nest. I met Tony because he was a car guy, and car guys stick together. Please welcome Tony Fidel. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So, Tony, you've done all of these wonderful Internet of Things, the machines rising, um, and you're a car guy. Yeah, a car guy for sure, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Is there a, a, an intersection of cars and machines? Well, I'm, you know, maybe some people have read it, but you know, now I am in the auto business. So I have gotten into the auto business with a partner over there. Where's Dave Bell? Dave, are you out there? That's Dave. We're in the auto business together. We want to throw up this slide. Where's that? The next slide, please. The really good thing. That. We're in this auto business. Actually, you can see the car right here. This is the Active Motors Aero. Um, it's the first uh, internet-connected go-kart, electric go-kart. Um, right here in Detroit with my grandfather, uh, I guess, uh, 40 some odd years ago, uh, right in Chandler Park, uh, we were building our own go-karts, our own, or not go-karts, but soapbox derby racers. So literally, we built our own from scratch. He taught me how to do everything. And I said, what, how am I going to get that same experience with the kids today, with my kids and the other families around there? It's not just about buying something, it's about wrenching things, you know, making and, and using your hands and using your mind. And so Dave and I cooked this up, and that, this is literally an EV, uh, an electric vehicle. Uh, it charges, it races, you control it with your smartphone. Uh, parents can set the speed limits, can set the distances and all those things. You get all of the um, necessary stuff. But this is now the uh, auto business we're in, and hopefully we're going to take it even further than that. But, uh, you know, this is just a love of mine, and uh, hopefully one day all the kids are going to want to wrench these with their fathers, mothers, grandfathers. What Maybe. about the kids wrenching their dad's cars? Uh, that just might happen, because uh, we've had a lot of requests by dads and parents to uh, get one their size. You're building this now. Yep, we're building it now. And uh, what will it retail for? Uh, I think the starter kit is what, $9.99? I think it's something like that. And, and those body kits are all, all Oh yeah, you can, you can take it apart, you can change the body kits, you can get a drift kit for it, you can get different larger batteries, like literally you can set it up all different ways and it's a whole software platform, you know, and an app that goes, goes on your Android or iPhone. Okay, so you've thought about the cars, you're building cars. Yeah. You've been at the uh, melting pot of the Internet of Things. What does Detroit need to do to uh, maintain or recapture or become the, the center of the car universe again? Well, right now there's a major struggle, right? Between you're reading it every day about self-driving cars. We're, you know, if you look at, in general, there's three existential problems that the automakers around the world, not just in Detroit, have. The first one is electric vehicles. We understand that. Everybody's been seeing that with Tesla and that. The second one you're hearing about is really uh, you know, the whole self-driving or certain kinds of autonomous driving, not just of cars, but of trucks, these kinds of things. right? And the third biggest one, and this is one that everyone's asking, well, why is everyone so interested in self-driving cars? It's because Uber happened. Uber has created such an environment that now cars for many, many people, especially consumers, may not be buying cars any longer. They'll be looking at cars as a service. So those three existential problems are facing every manufacturer, auto manufacturer around the world. And how are they going to adapt? And it's really going to be a lot about software, tons of software, tons of sensors, all the things that, you know, as you saw in a lot of the slides, you know, the, the first slide up there. How are they going to embrace that? How are they going to actually change themselves because literally they have been outsourcing that capability for years. If you remember that company, Motorola, Motorola was created to build radios that the car companies bought to put in the cars. And over the years, they've always been outsourcing all of those electronics, the software, all of those things. While they've been worried about drivetrains and inter internal combustion engines and all these other things. So they've been literally focused on 
the, the wrong thing that we need right now to be able to recapture the net world. What is the world going to look like in 2040? What is it going to look like in 2035? That's the, that's the kind of questions I wrestle with right now all the time. Detroit, uh, at, its, uh, at its beginning of the auto industry, was, uh, was chock full of entrepreneurs. It was all about, if we recall, uh, there, was, there were steam cars, there were electric cars, there were internal combustion engine cars, so it, was, it wasn't about the, the propulsion, it was just about this mode of transportation. It seems that that whole entrepreneurial spirit has gone to the West Coast, uh, and it exists there now. How, how, do those, how, does, or how do the established automakers bring that entrepreneurial spirit back and inculcate this part of the world with it? Well, I think if you look at it, you know, these cultures have been built up over many decades, right? Century in some cases. And it's really, really hard to change a culture. To change a culture is too hard. You start new cultures. You know, Back in my days at Philips, you know, 20 years ago, Philips bought some factories in Hungary. When the Eastern Bloc opened up, they bought some factories in Hungary, and I was looking for manufacturing. And they told me the story. They went into Hungary, and they took this old factory with these PhDs, these really entire, incredibly smart people. But they had been producing the same product for 20 years. And there was no productivity. There was nothing going on there. So what Philips did was they said, oh, wait a second. We're going to go in. We're going to put in all the latest equipment. We're going to go freshen up everything. We're going to make it all great, and they're going to get you know, new projects, and it's going to be great. And what happened was, a year later, nothing had changed. The, surf, the surfaces have changed, the equipment changed, but nothing else changed because the culture didn't change. So what did they do? They went down just a couple kilometers down the street, bought a different factory, took half of the workers, put them in different jobs, took the same equipment, moved it, and they had 10x productivity gain literally wow. one year later. You, it's so hard to change cultures. So I think one of the biggest things that the auto industry is going to have to see is how are they going to change their culture or create the new one? Because changing it is really hard. How are they going to create new ones? And if you look at something like Ford did, what do they do? They're opening offices in Palo Alto. But they're also opening new satellite sites around here to create new cultures so that they can grow in a new way for this new world that we don't know what it's going to be, but it's definitely not the old world, and the old world's not going to figure it out, or the old culture is not going to figure it out as well. I was staggered to hear uh, a week or two ago that the United Airlines has just opened four new routes directly to San Francisco from here for this very reason that there's a lot of travel that's going back and forth. Last time I went to San Francisco, I ran into a dozen people from Ford Motor Company, high-ranking people who were going out there. The question is, can we bring some of that intelligence or insight here? Do we have to do that? Do we have we, to? We, we absolutely have to do it. And the thing is, and this is what the great thing is, and you know, given uh, my, you know, my experience, is that the one thing besides all this great talent in Silicon Valley is the fact that most of it is software. We got rid of most of the hardware years ago. Kind of right when I showed up, you know, 30 years ago was when everybody was getting rid of the hardware. The thing is, most of the engineers there and, and have grown up in the software-only world. And they think the software-only world is a lot easier. And they, they see a problem, they go, oh, we can fix that. The problem is, is to be able to build these kinds of vehicles with all the electronics, all the software and everything, it's a lot harder than it looks. It's incredibly hard. You know, an iPhone or a you know, smartphone, it's got a little bit of mechanics, it's got all these things. We're talking something t on a whole different scale. And you can't underestimate what it takes to build these things, to design these things. So yes, there's a lot of software, but to actually manufacture them with all the regulations, with all the rules, all these things, it's incredibly hard. And so that is the... the What's going to happen over the next 10 years is going to figure out whether Detroit and Michigan is going to actually play in this space or not. And luckily, from what I've seen in my tour and, and deep dives that I've been having recently, there is hope for the companies here. You know, they can either be, they can either be a leader, they can either get sold off in parts, like a lot like Tesla bought a bunch of stuff like that, or they're going to literally get bought up by another company because they collapsed. 
I do think there's at least one company in this area that's going to be able to become a leader because they've embraced it. Hopefully there's going to be two. I don't know if there's going to be three. Is that right? It's what it feels like right now. I'm not going to ask you where you've been yeah, the last, uh, <laughs> last few days. Um, let's, uh, you brought up the T word, Tesla. Uh, would we be where we are now were it not for Tesla? In, in, in our current No, I think, I, think there, I think there was two things. I think there's Tesla and I think there's Dieselgate. Those two things have created a mass rush to EV. And then Uber created the mass rush to self-driving or autonomous vehicles. So those two things, I think, are really the, 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 the spur of what's going to happen. Now the next thing is, what is the world going to look like in 2035 for auto manufacturers? What are you going to be doing? Today, you don't buy just one pair of shoes and use them for everything. That's what you do with a car. You buy one car and you use it for every single purpose. Today, living in Paris, what do we do? We pick up Uber and we say, today we need a van. Tomorrow we needed a, a small compact car. We need a black car. We need different things. You're going to see that people, consumers are not going to be buying cars. They're going to be choosing on the day or for a week the car they want, whether it's self-driving or not. They're going to choose that pair of shoes Mm -hmm. to get around that they need to get this done done. You know, you've seen all these amazing concept cars. Here's the car for the beach. Here's the car for the mountains. But at the end of the day, it becomes a compromised car because you have to use it for commuting every day and else. What you're going to be picking up is the beach car for that beach weekend. That's going to be amazing and it's going to be perfectly tailored with surfboards and all that other stuff when you're in that area to do so. Right. right? We're going to see dramatically different designs because today you buy one thing and it's compromised. You're going to be able to pick up anything you want and either drive it or it'll drive you in 2035, 20, 2040. That's the dramatic difference that's going to happen in the auto industry for consumer vehicles. So as a uh, public car magazine, should I be fearful? Um, uh, I, I, and, and I will uh, maybe should preface it by saying I do believe that the current generation of young people still cares about cars. They still care about driving. They just can't afford it. I think there's a lot of kids today who, who do believe that they still want that because it, it, it shows them freedom, right? It's that right. independence. But I also think there's a lot of kids who don't want it. And I think they're going to want to spend their money on other things because they're not going to want to have that. So, and I think that's what's going to happen is, why was I a car fanatic? Because, the, you know, my, my parents, I remember my dad getting the town car, running around in the big town car, you know, and then their parents. But that's, you know, my great-grandparents, they didn't have a car. So it depends on what the generation taught them. Right. So this generation, maybe a certain percentage don't want cars anymore. The next generation is probably even less who's going to want cars okay. right, to own them. So, so it's, it's a matter of, you know, it's, it's cycles. Uh, obviously, it's cycles. Uh, you have talked about 2035, and um, uh, I guess I will be around there, hopefully. No, you will. The, uh, the, 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 the thing is, what is the generation of kids who are growing up now are you looking at that next generation? Is that one of those points of light, like autonomy and, and uh, uh, sharing environment? That Yeah, absolutely. If you look at those kids and what they're going to want to do, they want that special thing. They want that thing that's just so perfect for that. Um, for that uh, like they want an app for specifically this, an app for specifically that. Well, they're going to want a car for specifically that. And, you know, You'd love to always own a track car and go drive when you want to drive, but not everyone can own a track car. But right. maybe you can get one for the weekend, right, and try it, Makes and then put sense. it back. Well, let's bring it back to Detroit. I, I really would love to know, what is it that Detroit can do to become and be really integral to that Internet of Things in the car economy? Well, all small companies, all big companies start from a small seed, right, like a tree. Right? They all start from a small seed to grow. You know, Ford was a small little company. There's going to be, and this is what's great, is I'm seeing a lot, we drove around an hour and a half before we got here and saw all kinds of small companies starting. There is an environment here, a very low cost environment, unlike Silicon Valley, that can attract this talent for entrepreneurs who want to come here. I think that there's got to be a way to, to incentivize those people to come here and to, to build these companies because they're going to need net to be next to uh, all the auto manufacturers that are there. 
right? If you think about it, how did Detroit start? It was one small company, and then there's all these feeder companies into them for the manufacturing. Well, we're going to need the same thing for all kinds of software, services, these kinds of things. So these small companies can start uh, plant roots here, whether it's their headquarters or some offshoot, because they're going to need to be talking to all of these, these companies, because they're going to need the capabilities that are here, because you can't build them out there. Is it in the best interest of the auto companies to start a feeder system like that? I think they, they, I think they should start a feeder system of interns, a huge rush of interns, to show everybody how hard it is. And then when they hear these other companies in Silicon Valley, yeah, well, you're going to build cars. And they come here and then they see how they're really built. They're going to go, wait a second. They're going to go, you know, smart people are going to go, wait a second. Like, really? How are you going to do all that? This is what it takes, yeah. really, to make them safe and all that stuff. And safety in a self-driving world is really, really, really difficult to prove. As we know. As we know. You've been in a self-driving car. Um, I don't know that I could give up that control. What's it like? It's, it's so mundane, that's what's so great about it. <laughs> No, look, you love a car, you love control, but you know what, when you live in traffic all day, 98% of the time, you don't want to be driving. There's 2% of the time when you want control. That's that weekend when you want that perfect car for that perfect drive, but most of the other times you don't need it. You don't want it. You want it, if you can say, and this is what I get, I get two minutes, it comes to my door. This, this is a and then so, dark, And then I'm sitting there talking with my kids, taking them to school, and having great time, and if they get out of line, I can actually turn around and get them. I don't, I'm not gonna like crash. You know what I mean? So. Well, if you're telling me I can clobber my kid in the back of the car <laughs> and not no, worry about no. it, okay, that's great. You give him a that's big what, hug, yeah. you, you know, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, what, what's keeping the, uh, what are, what are, what's keeping the automakers awake at night right now? If those three things aren't keeping them awake, which is, uh, autonomous driving, cars of the service, and, and electric vehicles, then they're asleep at the wheel. That's but right. you know, look at Chevy Bolt, right? I love that New York Times headline, I think it was New York Times headline just two days ago, which says, Tesla dreamed up the future, except, you know, GM got there first, right? You know, so it's really great to see that kind of innovation. Um, you might have the great idea, but execution's everything. Right, and you got to be able to do that. So yeah, I, I give lots of credit to Elon for what he's doing, and he spurred so many people into action, and that's great. We need that. Yeah. And so I hope we see many more of those things. And Dieselgate did the same thing in Germany, who were sitting on their butts for so long. Because I remember, what was it, six years ago, we were talking about diesel on stage. Yep. Right. We're saying, da, da, da. and then what do we find out? I feel like a chump. Oh. Well, being yeah. sold the diesel story. Yeah, not, not only a diesel story, but a car or two. Yeah, yeah there, you, there you don't go. Don't get me started. Good. Um, I don't know if we have time for any questions. Oh, the reactor panel reactor will do that? Okay. okay. Then uh, we'll let the reactor panel do that. Is so, we'll, any parting words that you've got for us, Tony, on, on Detroit and automobility in the future? Well, I, one thing is there's a ton of extra space in Detroit. Why don't we take an eighth of Detroit and turn it into an autonomous vehicle area where everybody's just testing and doing stuff and creating startups around it and figuring it out. We got tons of space here. Let's use it and we need it for cars. We need it for trucks. We need it for delivery vehicles. We got the space. We're trying to get lots of people here. Let's use it as a, as a proving ground. Let's show the world what an autonomous city can look like. Are you listening, Detroit? Thank you, Tony Fidel. Appreciate it, man.